Good morning, everyone. It's good to see a great number out for this Lord's Day morning worship assembly. We're glad that you joined us. We'll be studying from God's Word together here for a few minutes together. Uh, We're so glad that the Flowers family is back after what feels like it's been uh, a long time, about a week and a half. They were down preaching. uh, Jesse was preaching in Alabama and in Kentucky, and yet we got one more week of the replacements. I'm sure you're all disappointed. Uh, Fifth fifth Sunday speakers uh, here at the end of the month of July. So here we are uh, with August upon us. Uh, I'll be speaking this morning, of course, and then Nathan Jenkins will bring the lesson this evening. We want to look into God's Word, do exactly what God's Word teaches us, and so that's what I hope to do this morning in guiding our study. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3 is where you find a part of the story of King Solomon. And one of the stories from King Solomon's uh, early years as the king of Israel, as we all know, Solomon was granted wisdom by God and was said to be uh, wiser than, than anyone after receiving that wisdom and discernment from God. And God then gives us a story to show just how wise Solomon was. And it's this story about dividing the child. Perhaps we're familiar with this story. Let's read the text in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16, to see about Solomon's wisdom here. 1 Kings 3, verse 16, Then two women, who were harlots, came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. It happened on the third day after I gave birth that this woman also gave birth to a child, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, only the two of us in the house. This woman's son died in the night because she lay on it. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead son in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, behold, he was dead. But when I looked at him carefully in the morning, behold, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, No, for the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. But the first woman said, No, for the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Verse 23, Then the king said, The one says, This is my son who is living, and your son is the dead one. And the other says, No, for your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. The king said, Get me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Then the woman whose child was the living one spoke to the king, For she was deeply stirred over her son and said, O my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, He shall be neither mine or yours. Divide him. Then the king said, Give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is the mother. When all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. It's an incredible story. You know, it's actually a story that the world likes to mock. They can't imagine that any woman would be so cruel as this second woman who says, divide him. What could possibly make a person say, divide the child? You know, of the three characters in the story, the king, the the true mother, and the false mother, Uh, she's the only one who I think was serious to go ahead and let that child die. She had been through this trauma of her child having died and it possibly, I'm sure, feeling the guilt of her own fault for having laid on him in the middle of the night. And so she's now willing to let that child die. Solomon, this is clearly a test. He, through the wisdom of God, is wanting to discern the hearts of these women. Was he serious if they had both been fine with it? Perhaps, if, if that was what uh, was necessary. But I think in his wisdom and the wisdom of God knew that this was going to reveal who the true mother was. 
course, the true mother is willing to do anything to make sure that child doesn't die. But this woman is willing to say, divide him. You see, she has no love for this child. It's not her own. You see the spite in her when she says, he shall be neither mine or yours. She'll, she's willing to let that woman lose her son because she's felt that pain. You should have to feel it too. You can see the envy and the jealousy in her. As I thought about, boy, what would it take to become that person who was willing to say, divide the child, let him be divided? I thought about something much, much, much more important than that hypothetical in my head, which I'll probably never run across, and that's this idea of dividing the church. Which of us would be willing to divide the church? Or would we be more like that first woman who is so willing to do anything, even give up our own child to a woman who is not going to be a very good mother to that child, just to prevent that division from happening? Which of these two women am I? So we'll use the, the story here in 1 Kings chapter 3 today as a bit of a parable. These two women, am I this good mother who's willing to give up anything to prevent a division? Or am I this woman who is simply willing to let the division happen because of her own selfish feelings? Now you might think to yourself, well, I would never, I would never be involved in any way in the division of the church or push anything to that point. But I want you to notice in the scriptures, <clears throat> I can't think of an example where a church specifically split, like we may see uh, in, in these days. <clears throat> but what you do see are some of the things that can lead right up to that. Notice some of the, the divisions that are mentioned in the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians, we're all pretty familiar, I think, in those first few chapters of the divisions into parties that were happening at, the, at that local church. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, I hear that there are divisions among you, but as we read on, they're not worshiping in different locations. He's talking to a single church, but 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. So verse 12, it says, now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. If there's ever a moment where it feels like there are different camps, like you might say, yeah, on this issue, there's really just, there's really two camps. Well, you might need to think about why is that, and where can that lead? That this camp is taking one position, and this camp over here is taking another one, so there's different groups. Well, that's where division starts. You need to think at that point, how can I cross the aisle? How can I go and talk to whoever might be in that other camp so that we can bring this division back together? Another example you see is in Galatians 2 and verse 12 when it's talking about Peter and the Gentiles. Remember, he was holding himself aloof when certain brethren came from James and the circumcision, and he had previously been associating with the Gentiles. But now, because of that pressure, that peer pressure, he decides to keep himself aloof. That's not a word we use a whole lot. It, it, another word that's used in some translations is withdrawn. And so when we recognize that some brethren are withdrawing themselves, this isn't, you know, when a brother is marked and we have to withdraw fellowship from that brother. No, this is while we're members, but certain ones are withdrawing. Maybe you yourself are withdrawing because you don't feel like you're in alignment with the rest of this group. That's the beginning of division. But even in Philippians 4.2, you find a division just between two individuals. Difficult names to say, Yodia and Syntyche, perhaps, uh, who were not living in harmony. And Paul, in a letter to their, their congregation, says, you two are not, these two need to live in harmony with one another. That is a, another small beginning of division. But perhaps even smaller, notice this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, where it talks about a talk that can spread like gangrene, or some translations say cancer. Things that we understand, they start small, but if you don't deal with it, it spreads. 
Notice 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 18 here on the screen. Be diligent, a very familiar verse to us. Study, as it says in the King James Version, to show yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. He doesn't always mention what specific false doctrine was causing the division, but here he does, this resurrection having already taken place. But that kind of talk, things that are not uh, bound by God, things that are not commanded by God, things that are certainly not by the authority of the Scriptures, that kind of talk, pushing that kind of thing, can spread, and it can what? Upset the faith of some. Is that what we want? No, I don't think any of us want to upset the faith of any. Dividing the church, it can be done even while the church is still here worshiping and assembling together. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 this morning as our primary text. If you want to flip over there. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, thank you Josiah for reading that for us. But I think it's going to give us some some very important solutions and keys to preventing division. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3, if I can read that one more time, it says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. If you pause just for a moment there, that calling was from Jesus, and he makes that call to us from the cross when he says, Father, forgive them, from uh, his preaching, of course, when he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. That's the call. And now we have been called into fellowship and we are members now with Christ. And now we're supposed to walk in a manner worthy of that calling. <laughs> such a high calling and such a, a tall order to now walk in a manner worthy of that. And then he describes it. Verse 2, he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I see, the, I see the child in that third verse. What is it that we're trying to keep from being divided and split into two? Well, it's the unity, the oneness. We want to keep that child together, right? We want to keep the church together, that those for whom Christ died, and we're supposed to be diligent, work hard, to preserve it, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so he gives us five attitudes. And these five attitudes, I want you to see, we've, we've looked at some of these terms before, but in this context, it's these attitudes are important for the sake of unity. So how do we apply these five things from verse 2 to the idea of being unified, humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance for one another, and all these things being done in love. Let's look at these, these terms together, and then the lesson will be yours. This phrase, not just humility, but he says all humility in the New American Standard. So think of it as every, every bit of humility that you can muster, and all the time. Interesting from the Greek word that it's a compound word from tapenos, which means not far from the ground, just something that's very low. And friend, which means the mind. So one uh, translator or, or uh, dictionary mentions that it's a deep sense of one's littleness. That's what humility is. Never forgetting how small you are. That's a good thing to keep in your mind, an image of just being low. Over in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, it says to regard others as more important than yourself. Philippians 2, a, a great passage we know that shows that this is an attitude that was in Christ Jesus and should also be in ourselves, verse 5. But it says, uh, starting in verse 3, Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And verse 4, Do not 
merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, I don't know if your translation has the word merely in there, but it might be in italics if it's there. Uh, and I have a note in my margin, John Gentry actually studied on this verse, and so I'm going to quote him this morning. The language, the original language doesn't support the word merely. That's supplied in trying to understand what he's saying, but I, it's even more extreme than don't merely look out for your own interests. No, it's don't look out for your personal interests, but for the interests of others. Isn't that the definition of the word love that we use Oftentimes, this agape love is, what does the other person need? Well, it's also here tied into this idea of humility, and so they're very closely tied. So others are more important. If I'm making a list of who's the most important in this congregation, my name's at the bottom. I'm the least important than these little ones, than some of those who are elderly, than someone who might be new to the group, somebody who's been here for 30 years doesn't matter. They're all more important than me. And so everything I'm doing, everything I'm choosing, everything I'm saying is to serve them, to help them. See, in 1 Peter 4 and verse 10, it talks about your gifts and every gift that you receive from God is for serving others, right? That 411, if we flip over there, is where we see this idea of if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Uh, but just before that, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in the serving of one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So anything that you have doesn't elevate yourself, but gives you just another tool to help somebody else. And I noticed that this is where Solomon begins. So going back to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3, you have his beautiful prayer where he asks God for wisdom. It's kind of that moment that we all wish that we could have where uh, Aladdin rubs the lamp and the genie comes out and gives him three wishes, anything you want. Well, in this case, God gives him one wish, right? And Solomon shows some wisdom before he receives wisdom by asking God for something that God is pleased with. It's like 1 Kings 3, verses 7 through 9, in the middle of the night. If I was aroused in the middle of the night, I wouldn't even be thinking clearly. But he gets this dream in the middle of the night, and he prays such a solemn prayer. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Do you think that the children of Israel were all just shining, perfect citizens that Solomon was excited to serve? No, I'm guessing these generations are all largely the same, where there's some, some undesirables among them, and, and uh, even like we'd studied with Noah, even after Noah comes off the ark, God recognizes that from our youth, we're not very upright. We seek out evil things. And yet Solomon's mindset of himself to them is he is just a little child, doesn't know anything, doesn't know what's best. And they are this great people of yours. That's the key. It's not about the people. And this congregation here, we all know each other fairly well. It doesn't take too long to get to know each other. And regardless of who we're close with or not close with, this is the great people of God. And I am a little, tiny, insignificant person who has to serve them. And I want to do it well. I want to do it so that they grow and grow stronger and closer to, to one another so that the work of God can continue so that more souls can be added so that this church can be a pillar in support of the truth here at this place for years to come. This great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. Imagine a man who takes on the responsibility of the eldership and suddenly 60, 70, 80 people are coming to him with their concerns, with their challenges, with their problems. 
What a great weight of responsibility. This should be the prayer that he's praying every day. To give me an understanding heart, a heart of wisdom. That word actually uh, in, in, the, in the margin of the New American Standard says a hearing heart. A hearing heart. Doesn't it take humility to be one who is hearing rather than always wanting to speak and share your great knowledge? No, a hearing heart. That's what Solomon prays for. Give me a hearing heart to understand and discern so that I'll know what's right and wrong and be able to judge for the good of the people. So humility, all humility, that's where, where uh, Paul begins in his list of things that will make for unity. But then he goes on to talk about gentleness. Gentleness, this word... Uh, is essentially, as I think of that word, we, we know what gentleness is. It's the way we treat everyone <laughs> at first. And it's, it's funny to me and it's sad to me. I, it's, and it's not, uh, I'm not talking about anyone but myself at this point. We know how to be polite to a person that we're just meeting. And we're kind and gentle. It's the way you might treat a visitor when they come in the back door, someone you've never met. But then after you've known them for years and years, maybe it's your close family, right? Well, that's where the rudeness is shown. That's where the sarcasm every day, it's where you can really treat a person without gentleness. And have you ever heard someone say, well, that just means I like you. I, I treat you that way because I like you. Uh, because they feel comfortable. And I get that. They've, they've been able to let their guard down in some way and just be themselves. Well, if yourself comes across as rude and harsh and biting at, the, at another person, it can eventually wear them down. It's, it's, it's maybe that others are just overlooking the rude and harsh, biting things that you say uh, just to get along, but they don't enjoy it. Not many people enjoy a lack of gentleness. The Greek word here, <clears throat> proutes, is translated meekness in other places. So meekness and gentleness are the same idea, but from a root preus, and, and from this uh, Bible study tools help site. It, it gave a, a good explanation of what this means or where this comes from. Those who are wholly relying on God rather than their own strength to defend against an injustice. And so toward evil people, it means knowing God is permitting the injuries that they inflict and that he is using them to purify his elect and that he will deliver his elect in time. So imagine a person who is being bombarded with uh, hate, hateful speech, some kind of uh, attack, but that person is calm and centered and not returning insult for insult, but simply taking a moment to think about what might be most beneficial to the other person to share, because they're not concerned about getting any kind of revenge of their own, because God's going to take care of that in the end. These are all things that we know, but it's hard to remember in that moment, right? When we are dealing with some kind of a conflict, our, our internal temperature starts to rise and we may feel a little bit defensive and want to, to stand up for ourselves. But no, God may be using this moment to train us and teach us. And so we're not interested in, in uh, returning that to the other person. You know, the word gentleness I think it's interesting where it often stands in relation to self-control uh, in these lists, like Galatians 5, 23, where we've got the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness and self-control. See, it's not that a gentle person is weak. A gentle person has great strength, but that strength is under control. And they've chosen not to use whatever strength they have to fire back. He also says over in 2 Peter 1 and verse 6 that you add to your knowledge self-control. Because I'll tell you, the hardest time to be uh, self-controlled and, and gentle is when you know you're right. That other person just said something that's completely wrong. And I've got the answer and I can't wait to show them. Well, that's when you can lash out in cruelty without any kind of gentleness. That's the time where self-control is needed so much. Add to your knowledge self-control because that's how you might actually help that person speaking to them with kindness. See, in 2 Timothy 2.25, it says, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. That's how you might actually help the person rather than 
you imagine this political situation in America, right, with just the back and forth and back and forth, uh, or maybe imagine the internet where people are just arguing without any love for one another. Well, that's not going to actually change anybody's mind. But with gentleness, you might do it. It says in Colossians 4 and verse 6, let your speech always <clears throat> be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. There's a different way to respond to different people. Salt makes something taste better and go down a little easier, right? Than something that doesn't taste very good. So how are we going to help them absorb that information best? We could have gone with this list this morning, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9. He says, to sum up, all of you be harmonious, <clears throat> sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. Think about that next time you are receiving an insult or receiving the evil in whatever way it manifests. How am I going to bless that person? Doesn't that sound, doesn't that sound wishy-washy or weak? Well, that's what God wants from us. Give a blessing. How am I going to bless this person rather than try to show that I'm strong enough to respond back uh, to what they're saying. Lacking gentleness, as, it, as we see in James 3, verses 13 through 18, it reveals bitter jealousy <clears throat> and selfish ambition. Notice what it says. <coughs> Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So this isn't just comparing God's wisdom to the world's wisdom, he's showing the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You see the word peace all through there. And, it's, and I think it's good to emphasize that uh, as we have conversations with those who may disagree, that wisdom from above is first pure. We're not going to sacrifice anything about the purity of the gospel or purity of the doctrine, but as soon as we've got that established, we know the truth, and we're standing for the truth, everything about what we're saying is about peace, gentleness, reasonableness, mercy. That is what God expects. That's how you sow peace. We're not sowers of division. We're sowers of peace. And we want that peace to be planted and grow so that it can serve all who want to become a member of our congregation. <clears throat> so patience is a key part of this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, gentleness is a key part of this. And the next thing that God, that God emphasizes to us is that patience is important. How is patience different from what we've talked about? You know, I, I've heard people say, I have no patience for him. <laughs> have you ever said that about another person? I just have no patience for that person. And it's, it's easy to get caught into that. But consider the Lord's long suffering. We won't look at Exodus chapter 34, but it talks about how great the Lord's long-suffering is His mercy, which is everlasting. We know that the Lord is long-suffering. Imagine what He puts up with you and me. When we come to Him in prayer, begging for His forgiveness, and then we're right back at His door, not too long later, with a similar prayer for the same forgiveness. And yet He endures. He doesn't strike us dead right then. He doesn't send us where we deserve to go. He wants us to come to repentance and to be with Him eternally. <clears throat> you see, <coughs> this word patience emphasizes the idea of bearing with someone else. The mature are those who recognize and bear with immaturity. Isn't that the case, that the more mature person is the one who can take the high road and not, not lose their patience? Notice, uh, as the men studied in 1 Corinthians 6 last month, the, the, the instruction there was, why not rather be wronged? Rather than taking your brother to court and demanding justice outside of the church and bringing shame on the church, 
Just let it go. Let that person take whatever they took from you and let it go for the sake of peace. Isn't that what the true mother is doing? She's saying, let the child live. You can have him. I don't want this to hurt the child. I want this child to live. So she's willing to let herself be wronged. <clears throat> Notice in Proverbs 26, it says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will also be like him. So another reason to not dive into that, that dispute is that you're, you may be dragged down by it. Sometimes it's better to just let that foolish comment go on away. Let it, let it peter out. When we look at the elders' qualifications, what do you find? <clears throat> Elder, elders are said to be not a brawler in 1 Timothy. And in Titus it says, not soon angry. This quality is something that those who are selected to lead should have, and so all of us should aspire to, that we're not one who's eager to get involved in a dispute, not one who's wanting to get down into a fight. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 through 15, it says to live in peace with one another. Have patience. As it says, <clears throat> live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, but be patient with who? With everyone. Patience is needed with everyone. See to it that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. That's what we should be seeking. We're so patient that we're th looking only for what's good for one another and for all. But fourth on our list, we see this word tolerance. Tolerance for one another. When you see that word, you probably think what the world is doing with that word today, right? Society has abused this term. Isn't that sad what they've done? But notice in the same chapter, if you're in Ephesians chapter 4, you can see this for yourself, but I've listed them here. In the very same chapter, <clears throat> it, doesn't, uh, it, it tells us in Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, not to tolerate sin. And it gives all kinds of examples of sins that we shouldn't be engaged in. And so this is not talking about, well, we're going to be tolerant of, of sin. That's not what the Lord's church is called to do. We're not supposed to tolerate false doctrine, uh, as it mentions in verses 14 and, and 15, and certainly no uni unity and diversity, which some would say, well, that's the kind of tolerance God wants, that, that all the churches in town, whatever group might call themselves a church, should be unified, even though we preach completely different things from the words of God. No, he gives that list of seven ones right there in the same context, that there is one body, there is one Lord. There's one faith, one hope. And so those ones are certainly the things that we should stand for and not tolerate additions to that. So what is he saying when he says, I want you to have tolerance for one another? Well, I think the challenge is, think of this idea of that one body. Well, it's made up of different people. And in the context, chapter 4, verse 25, he calls us members of one another. And so we are supposed to recognize that since I'm part of a body, I should be tolerant of the other parts of this body. But it's, it's hard, and, and maybe you, you've found yourself saying, but I, I just can't stand that Christian. I just can't tolerate them. Maybe because of the way they are. They're so different from me. Maybe they're too loud, or that person's just too quiet, or that person's too negative. They're too opinionated. They're too gruff, or they're too serious. or We just don't have anything in common. Or that's not the way I was raised. You know, we, we've, we're just completely different. Or they're just not from around here. Nope. These are the kinds of things that can make us not like each other very much. We're just looking for people who are just like us. And we'll tolerate them. But the rest of the folks, I guess we're tolerating, but from as far of a distance as possible. Right? Maybe no one that you've met here uh, is, is like those great people who you used to know. Right? Sometimes people just never measure up to that perfect elder. Oh, we had, this, we had these great elders back home. They, they knew how to lead, you know. Uh, we had, oh, the teachers back where I come from were the greatest teachers if we just had someone like that. Or, or the real friends I used to have, they, they understood me and we were close. And nobody here is, you know, able to fill that void in my life. That's not, that's not 
loving and tolerating the people who we're with. <clears throat> Everything others do, maybe it's that's not the way I would have done it. Or perhaps you go around with a chip on your shoulder and say, can you believe what he or she said to me? Just ready for someone to knock that off. If they don't say it just right, can't tolerate that person. No, he says you must have tolerance for one another and show love. This is a sinful attitude. It says over in Jude verse 16, these are grumblers finding fault. And how do they speak? They speak arrogantly. That's why he started with humility on this list. It's arrogant to, to treat everybody else like they are bad, worthless, un unworthy of your friendship, and as if they have to measure up to some point before they can be close with you. You're finding fault in every other person. I, I can't recommend every episode of Seinfeld, but one of the main themes of that series was every time he, he meets a girl, he finds a fault. She eats her peas one at a time. Yeah, so she's not, she's not good enough. No, no, that, we can't be that kind of a person. No, it says pursue peace with all. Pursue it. Chase it. Go after that. That's my goal. I want peace with every person. That's Hebrews 12 and verse 14, but also mentioned in Romans 12. We'll look at that in a moment. But he says in James, he says, do not speak against one another. So after we leave here, I'm glad we're giving Jesse a break because at lunch we might all talk about what, what Jesse said in that sermon. Today you can talk about what Todd said in that sermon. Don't speak against one another. We're not supposed to be that way. Don't speak against one another. Don't complain against one another. I think we're all guilty of doing that. We need to stop. Stop complaining against one another. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. We're talking about Jesus right there. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We ought to lay down our lives. So what Jesus did, you know, when I think about laying down my life, I think of Ephesians 5 where it's talking about husbands and wives. Wives are supposed to be in sub submission, and husbands are supposed to show love as Christ loved the church, laying down his life for it. Well, here it's not just for your wife. It's for everyone in the room, everyone who's a member of your local congregation. Lay down your life for them. Because Jesus did it for the church. And when he washed his disciples' feet, it was not so that we could do something back for him, but so that we could also go and do it for others and wash the feet of one another, serving one another, like we sang this morning. Make me a servant. Lay down our lives for them. But we would never, we would probably not want to admit that we were guilty of hate. I hope not. But uh, the Bible speaks plainly about not hating your brother, and you need to consider, have you slipped to that point? Because if you have, you're a murderer in the eyes of God. Romans 12, it says, So far as it depends on you, overcome evil with good. Let's look at that text. Bless those who persecute you. I think when we talk about persecution, we usually go right to the government and maybe the people in the world, maybe somebody at the fair next week, if I ask them if they want to come to church and they laugh me off or like, you know, maybe we think of that as persecution. Well, I think a lot of persecution can come from right here within the church. Bless and do not curse them. Bless them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. There's humility. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. That admits that sometimes it's the other person that's preventing the peace. But what can you do? Think about what you can do. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, and replace that word enemy with brother just for a minute, because sometimes your brothers can become like enemies that you are struggling with getting along with. If he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You can overcome evil with good. What he's unwilling to do 
as far as being at peace with you, you might overcome that by being good to that person. So seek ways to bless the other person, and you might just overcome the evil with your good. <clears throat> and I almost didn't put in this, this fifth point, because in the, in the sentence he kind of uses the word in love to sum up some of these other qualities. And we've seen attributes of love in all of these points. I noticed that love is the opposite of biting and devouring one another. Over in Galatians chapter 5, <clears throat> For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. The solution is love. Love your neighbor as yourself, certainly not seeking to bite and devour one another. Very briefly, over in 1 Corinthians, uh, if you picked an epistle that you would say was the love epistle, I don't think 1 Corinthians would necessarily come to mind, but that's exactly how I think of it. Over in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, after all these chapters on different issues that he's been dealing with at that church, he sums it up by saying, let all that you do be done in love. And where do we find that love chapter that's often read at, at weddings and, and other places? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8, where it says, love is patient. Well, we've already talked about that. It's kind. It's not jealous. Love does not brag. It doesn't, it's not arrogant. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. That's a patient person who can't be provoked, where it doesn't matter what you come at me with, it's not going to stir me up to say an angry word. I, I can't be provoked because I love you. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Interestingly enough, the New King James says that it thinks no evil. But that idea of thinking no evil, isn't remember, it's remembering what someone else did to you. Well, it doesn't do that. It lets it go. So if I love you, I'm not thinking about my grievances. <laughs> I don't have a list of grievances that I need to air uh, at some point with you. No, it, it doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears, it believes, it hopes, it endures all things, and it never fails. So my love's never going to run out. I'll never get to a point where, okay, I was bearing with this for a few years, but now I need to just unload now I need to get it all off my chest. No, because I love you the way that Christ loves me. And I need to show the love of Christ even unto the end and never let it fail. Another place in 1 Corinthians says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so if we're diligent to preserve unity, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, then my knowledge isn't going to tear down. It's going to be coupled with love. And so how can I not let my knowledge get in the way and cause division? How can I build the church up in love? How can I keep it from dividing? Just like that mother. She gave up her son because she wanted the son to live. Just like Solomon, who prayed, Give me a heart of wisdom because of this great people of yours. I want to judge them well, because these people are not mine. Most kings might think of this kingdom as their kingdom. You see some kings like that in the Bible, but Solomon said, no, this is a great people of yours, and I've been put here to judge them, so I want to do it well. We, don't, we wouldn't want to divide that child. We'd be that woman on the left who's saying, no, 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 don't kill him. Give him to her. But would we divide the church? for similar reasons, because of a lack of humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, or love? I hope not. I have high expectations for each one and, and for myself that we will dig deeper into our, our hearts and in greater humility, in greater love, press on toward peace and unity, as we also have been doing. And so these are good things to be reminded of uh, periodically. 
that this is where unity comes from, from these attributes that were first in Christ Jesus and shown to us so that, so that they will also be in us. Perhaps you have sin in your life this morning. Perhaps this lesson this morning has convicted you of sin. Make that right before it's everlastingly too late. Make your life right. Uh, reestablish peace between yourself and your God by repenting before him. If you're not in the body of Christ, this is a great time to begin a new life in Christ by submitting to the doctrine of Christ, recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God and being willing to confess that, to repent of sin, to come to him for baptism, to have your sins washed away. Whatever your needs are, we invite you to come while we stand and sing our invitation song.